We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, we're talking about building and nurturing a Drupal practice in here. And honestly, whenever I submitted this session, I don't even remember what I was going to talk about. So this is really what I decided to talk about in the past week, which is building a Drupal practice more than nurturing one. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is Michael Smith. I work at VML YNR here in Kansas City, and I am a group director of technology, specifically for the Drupal practice for VML YNR. When I say VML YNR, I'm not trying to be pretentious. I'm trying to say YNR intentionally. It's very important. Um, right, so VML YNR, because I work for them and they are sponsoring me to be here, uh, there is a very large logo on the slide here so that you know who they are. Um, more than just putting the logo up there, though, and talking about who they are, um, VML is a, a digital marketing agency that um, is a global agency, about 8,000 people worldwide, and the important thing here is that we do a lot of technology and we do a lot of Drupal, and we spent the uh, past 12 to 15 years learning how to build a Drupal practice and learning to do Drupal very well at scale. Well, we think we do it very well at scale. Uh, at VML, we do four different technologies, mainly the Drupal open source team, which is the team that I get to be a part of and I'm very proud to lead slash represent. The AEM team, which is Adobe, the Sitecore.net team, and the mobile guys. Uh, of those four teams, our team is actually the biggest, and I think the you know, most successful and the most fun. So let's talk about what goes into building a Drupal team. And this can go really from uh, anything. It doesn't have to be Drupal. It can just, this is what goes into building a technology team. And the keynote, by the way, that was amazing. Uh, they could have really just given my talk. Everything they said applies here. It's building a team, taking no shit from people. I curse. Oops. So the first thing that goes into building the team is making sure that you have the right people on your team. So this is not everyone that's on our team here in Kansas City. This is just everybody who I found pictures of. Uh, so what do we talk about when we're looking for the right people? We're not necessarily looking for people who are Drupal experts. We're looking for people who are technology passionate, uh, people that are willing to learn how to do things, uh, how to ask questions, how to lead, and how to teach. We're not looking for people that have built 100 modules or people that can tell me exactly what a certain trait in PHP does or tells me the difference between PHP 5.4 and PHP 7.2. I don't care, and I probably can't tell you the differences either anymore. So what we're looking for are people that are smart and gets things done. I jumped ahead of my slide because that's the quote of the next slide. Um, has anybody ever heard that quote before? Smart and gets things done? This is Joel Spolosky. He's a software developer, owns a software company in New York, I don't know what it's called. He used to write a blog called Joel on Software, so there's tons of really great material there you should read if you get a chance. So when we talk about smart and gets things done, we're talking about people who are obviously very intelligent and can figure problems out, not necessarily people who already know the solution. When we hire people, when we do interviews, I'm not going in there and saying, okay, can you get up on the whiteboard and make bubble sort work for me? I don't care about bubble sort. I want to know, can you reason something out? So we're going to dive a little bit deeper into things. If you start talking about something in the interview, we're going to start going down a rabbit hole and see how far you can go until you can't talk about it anymore. And when you can't talk about it anymore, I'm going to say, now start reasoning out how you're going to find the next solution. That's somebody that's smart. That's somebody that's going to get something done. The other part of it is it gets things done. There are a lot of people that are, what I like to call architect astronauts. Architect astronauts are people who can make all these grand plans in the same way. We're going to build this incredible interface. It's going to have every different design pattern you've ever seen it. We're going to have flyweights and adapters and command patterns. I don't remember anything. Those are architect astronauts. They're awesome. They know a lot of stuff. They're very academic, and that makes sense because we're at a university here. However, are they going to get things done? Are they going to get down and write some code today so we can ship a product? Probably not. So we're not looking for those. We're looking for people who want to get things done. So smart and get things done.
Next part that we're looking for is people that can stretch their abilities. This is another thing that's important when we're looking at hiring people or finding the right people are people that can be very agnostic and work around in different technologies. Lots of times we'll talk to people who want to separate. You have the front end guys who just want to do JavaScript. And then we got the guys that are back end guys that just want to do PHP. They don't really want to touch APIs. And anything inside the browser is stupid. Those are not the kind of people we want to build a Drupal practice around. We want people that are able to touch anything. You don't have to be an expert on CSS or an expert on JavaScript or an expert on PHP, but you have to be willing to get in there and figure it out and not be afraid of it. Uh, so we want to encourage everybody to flex their abilities. In addition to just having people that are willing to do it, we want to actually find people that um, are going to go out and learn how to do all these new technologies and chase the shiny object and actually find out how to do the new cool things that everybody's working on. Really important when we're trying to find those um, developers to build our teams around. In the keynote, they talked about how we don't want rock star developers. Uh, I'm going to disagree. We do want rock star developers, but we also want rock developers. So your rock stars are the ones that are out there and they're just like doing crazy amounts of stupid stuff to make really cool new projects and they are the guys that you want to fix a problem for you. You say, man, I got this problem, find a way to fix it. That's a rock star developer. They're great. But if your team is made of just rock star developers, you're never going to put a solid product out because you're just going to chase the shiny all day. So the other type that you want is a rock. And we have a lot of rocks on our team, and those are the people that I can depend on every day to do the right thing and to follow the patterns that we've already found. So two types of developers we're looking for, the rock and the rock star. Uh, the next part of building and nurturing the Drupal team is that we need to teach and share everything we learn. So as we're flexing and finding all those new abilities, we need to go back and actually share that with the rest of the team and teach that to everybody. And that goes for all the different disciplines. So again, I talked about how at VML YNR we have four different technology disciplines. We don't just do Drupal. We do have a Drupal team. As part of our teaching and sharing, we actually go to the other teams and we say, hey, how do you do that in AEM? I hear ADM's really cool at media management. How can we make that better in Drupal? So a big part, a big tenet of having a successful technology team is the ability to go around and share and learn from everyone else. On our team specifically, we have a Drupal COE, which is a center of excellence. It's a group that meets once a month to go through and find all the problems that we have in Drupal and fix them. It's just a community so we can share the, the things that we've learned in the past month and find a way to fix them. Um, there was something else I was going to say, and I saw Todd over there, and he distracted me. <laughs> Thanks, Todd. Next part is that we need to really make sure that we care about the people that work for us, right? So all these people that are making up our Drupal team, they're the people that are making us money, and if we don't care about them, then they're just cogs in the machine, they're going to get burned out, they're going to walk away and find somewhere else that actually gives them something interesting to do. So that part of the building the team and nurturing the team is ensuring that we care personally. We're giving good, valid feedback to everybody who works on our team. We are understanding what they want out of their careers, what they want to be successful, what they want to be happy when they come to work every day. Nobody wants to come to work every day and be miserable. A lot of people don't like to come to work every day and work on the same project. So we need to find out what makes people tick and then give them cool, fun stuff to work on and actually care about them as a person. Uh, Jennifer, I think, actually mentioned the book Radical Candor, which is, uh, this actually said care personally before, which is a quote from Radical Candor. Uh, so the other part is giving good feedback to people and saying, look, I want you to be successful. I'm going to tell you what is actually needed from you to be successful. I'm not just going to let you languish. So in order to build good teams, good technology practices, we need to make sure that we care about the people that are working for us. I told you guys it's going to go fast. We're like halfway through. Tell me to slow down if you want. Uh, this is a big part. Simplify the easy stuff. So a lot of what we're doing is building, at least for us, we're building marketing sites. We're building the same thing over and over and over and over. Every website in the world has a carousel, and they all suck. Uh, 
why, why are we reinventing that wheel every time we build a new website? It is not fun, it is not cool, nobody wants to do it. So a big part of what we do is we make all that easy stuff simple. We say, look, we've done a carousel 100 times, let's just make a library. Let's just put it in Confluence and documentation, say this is what you want to do when you put a carousel on there. Don't reinvent it, there's no point. Um, make everything simple. If you make it simple, then we can spend the time doing the fun stuff if, when we find it. There's a lot of fun stuff we do. This one kind of goes with the last one. This is a uh, commoditize everything. I'm not sure this is actually like an industry accepted thing to do. Everybody wants to create the new cool thing. That's not what I want to do, but that's probably because I don't get to write as much code as I used to. So what I want is every single thing we do to be a commodity. If everything is a commodity, then we can estimate everything accurately and I can plan accurately. Uh, we've all probably done estimates before, right? You know that as a software developer, estimates are incredibly hard. Hey, build me a website, how long is it gonna take? I don't know. Six months, six million dollars, take your dick, right? Um, when we say that, though, we get a lot of unhappy customers and we get a lot of unhappy people working on projects with debt merges. So if we make everything a commodity, we make it easier. And by that, I mean we find out how long it's going to take to build something. We know exactly how much time it's going to take, exactly how much money it's going to take. So every single thing we do, if we've done it once, we write it down, and it's a commodity. We know how to do that from now on. Incredibly important, I think, for building a profitable Drupal practice. Maybe not successful, but profitable. Because that's why we all write code. Next thing is, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Uh, we're developers. We want to write code. We fix a lot of things that aren't broke every day. Uh, how many of you are JavaScript developers? Okay, so you guys know NPM packages, there's a million of them to do the same thing over and over and over. What What are you guys using to actually like build JavaScript now? Because it's probably different from last week, right? Like the compiler? Sorry if I'm real on JavaScript. Uh, no, it's, it's, we chase the shiny object. Um, if it's not broke, don't fix it. The biggest reason is that we can't count on that as a commodity if we're trying to change things every single time. If something works and there's no good reason to go back and fix it or change it, don't change it. However, we hit the flip side of it, and if we don't ever try to fix things, then we're still driving horse and carriage buggies around. So fix it. Uh, push the envelope. That's where the fun part of software development comes in. That's where people, that's where we make our chops, and that's where people learn to uh, come to our companies for the development that we do, is because we have that reputation of being able to push the envelope. So look for those new cool things to do, and actually do them, but only where it counts. Don't build a new carousel. Push new, yep. So, so I think you've hit on like the crux of maybe that issue, is how do you know and by what like determination do you figure out this is worth fixing even if it's not broke? This is worth fixing. Pain points. And uh, I think that's actually a slide here in the future. So the question there was, how do we decide what's worth fixing and what's worth leaving alone? So in my opinion, what you want to try to fix is anything that's a pain point. So as you go through your day, you say, man, I really hate the fact that we have to log into the website twice every day because it's kicking me out. That's something that we need to push the envelope and go fix. Or I really hate the fact that we're not, um, we're getting way too many bugs back in this sprint. That's a good set place to say, oh, well, our testing suite's not working out, then we should go figure out a better way to do that. We should find a new framework. Uh, does that make sense? Does that answer your question? No. Okay. Also, anything that looks really fun, <laughs> but not all the time. So I think this one is uh, this one is huge, especially if you work in an agency. I think is uh, most I know a lot of you in here work for the MLINR, so I know you work for an agency. Um, does anybody else work for an agency? I know the code cool the guys do, so you guys get to work on a lot of projects. So iterations on projects, I think, is what makes agencies so. Uh, so unique, and I think everybody should at some point in their life work for an agency where you get to work on a lot of projects because this is where you learn. This is where you learn to build a lot of really cool things really fast and learn this commoditization. 
we do iterations in sprints, right? So every sprint we learn how to do something, we make something just a little bit better, and then we go back and we look back and we say, hey, what did we do wrong? What did we do good? Let's fix the good, or let's keep doing that good stuff and fix the bad stuff. So we iterate every sprint. Same thing goes with projects. If I can work on 20 projects in one year, then I'm going to be way better at projects at the end of the year because I've had a lot of chances to make mistakes. I've thrown away a lot of lemons. We write a lot of lemons. As long as we're okay with having a short memory and fixing it next time, it's way better. So if at all possible, inside your Drupal practices, make sure that you can iterate. I understand some companies don't work on different projects, right? You work in one thing because that's what your company sells, but I think it's still good to find a way to iterate, find a way to throw away those old projects and build new ones and take your learnings further into the next project. I seriously have like four slides left. I feel really bad. Let's slow down. Talk like this. Uh, the next part is make sure that you're documenting everything. So we we came from kind of the Stone Age, I think, at VML YNR, the way we used to do things. Uh, every single project was a new project, and every project we did things different. So all these teachings, all these learnings, nobody was writing them down anywhere. So then we learned to start documenting everything. We like to use Confluence, but just find some sort of a centralized place where you can write every single thing down that you've learned. Document the build docs, document the way you build things, document your tech stacks. Uh, does everybody use the same tech stack for the different projects you work on, or is it different every time? You guys know what a tech stack is, like uh, Apache, MySQL, Linux, whatever, PHP, Drupal 8 point, whatever it is now. So we document those as tech stacks, and we say, look, we know these things work together. And even we go as far as like jQuery 1 point whatever, and QJS at 1 point whatever. I'm probably saying the wrong version summers. Uh, we document those as tech stacks, and then next time we go work on something, we say, we're using that tech stack. And I go look at the documentation for that, and I find out exactly how it's supposed to work. So document everything. Wow, I think I have two, two slides. Uh, oh. Yeah. I know you want to slow down, so I'm going to ask a Good question. Point. But when you say document everything, what else? Uh, architecture reviews. So document at the beginning of anything that you start with, exactly what you're going to write, how you're going to write it. Uh, even writing the architecture review itself is documentation or writing down the questions that you're going to ask each time. Build documents. Um, do you use a build document in your environments? Does anybody use build documents? Is that like a spec tool? Or? It's just a markdown document that tells me exactly how I'm going to build something. Okay, so we use uh, we use build docs, and it's in the root level of every project, stored in Git. So it's just a markdown file that tells exactly how we're going to build it. This is what the front end is. This is how we're going to use blocks. These are the different menus we're going to create. These are the different taxonomies we're going to create. Content types, users, etc. These are the third party services. Everything, all written oh, down. Okay, what do you call it? Just, just call it a design. Design, okay. Kind of like a, a functional design specification? Okay. Uh, we used to use functional design specifications, um, but those were more top level written by analysts saying that this is what it should do as opposed to this how it's going to be done. Um, they're both very valuable. We kind of use JIRA now more than using uh, functional design specifications, so each thing is stored in a story instead of in a big document. Uh, the build doc is more for developers, so it's not formal at all. It is written by developers and kept up to date by developers. Does that answer the question on the build doc and what that is? So that's a that's like a, a living document. It changes when you're like, we're doing it this way, and like a weekend, you're like, no, actually, we're doing it this way. Yeah, absolutely, building document. Uh, or living document. It doesn't have to be down to the detail levels like, hey, we changed this from using the filter HTML and the WYSIWYG to using a style HTML. That's probably not that important. We can go and look in the, uh, in the document or in the site itself. The build doc is more for how are we doing the front end build systems? How are we using blocks? Are we using components on this? Or are we using page level templates? Things like that. Uh, more high level, but still very developer oriented. So that's inside the project, is uh, we do those build documents as far as outside the projects. We've actually documented the way that we do uh, nearly everything, not nearly everything, but a lot of things. 
So if I ever go to uh, somebody not the Drupal group and they say, hey, how are you guys doing authentication management in Drupal? I can point to a document on Confluence and tell them exactly how we do uh, authentication on Drupal. Uh, that one, Drupal handles most of it, so it's not really needed to document it, but it's still there. Um, but we document it so that we don't have to wonder how to do it the next time, or how it works the next time. Uh, same with that, uh, we also do the documentation on the uh, retrospectives. So everybody do retrospectives at the end of the project. So retrospectives are incredibly important um, to go back and find out what we did right and what we did wrong. So we document those and put them all in Confluence and then aggregate them into you know, lessons learned throughout the different projects that we did over a year. Um, that's really great for following through to the next project, just finding out what we did wrong and what we did right. Uh, any standards that we set, like the fact that we're going to use Drupal Kit, that's all documented. Um, that type of stuff. Did you say Drupal Kit? Yeah, uh, gonna have to make a plug, I guess, here. Drupal Kit is uh, an installation profile that we've created at the MLY and Arts on GitHub. You can find Drupal Kit. It's a, a common set of components and modules. It's kind of like Aquia Lightning, except it's more for building marketing sites rather than Lightning is more built for building developer-oriented sites. Um, it's pretty cool. We're happy with it. It also has a lot of build stuff built into it, like uh, the use of Docker containers, uh, Doxel, thin commands, the way that we all are finding builds. The guy that wrote it just walked in the room. Talk about Drupal Kit. <laughs> Is there a question back there? Oh, yeah, I was just wondering if you have any public examples of your build docs, <coughs> or if there's a, like a template or, or something that you support. I can certainly share some. Yeah, um, blog post or something would be cool. Yeah, I can certainly share that. So I actually have a, another presentation tomorrow, on architecture reviews where we, that one is not going to be slide based, it's that we're gonna pull up an architecture review for Tyson, and we're going to look through the architecture review and exactly how we do that. Which is, it's kind of the same thing, but a little bit different. But yeah, I can, I can share a build doc. Uh, remember, they're not formal. They are developer written, right? Some of them are formal. I kind of follow the standard, so. so I've, I've found that every agency does it slightly differently, Yeah. I'm not going to start looking around my computer right now, but maybe I'll unplug, look for one, and I'll plug back in. <laughs> How do you handle the billing for all this documentation? Are your quotes just larger to handle for then we're going to have to write up? Like, yeah, because that's going to be the issue we're going to run into. Be like, great, who's going to spend the time, their free time to go and write up all the stuff? Ultimately, it's going to save time. Yeah, so that's part of the estimate, right? Mm -hmm. So when I look at uh, I look at something, estimating is hard. We all know that. This is why we commoditize everything. Uh, when I look at something and I say, "Hey, we want to put carousel on the web page," how long is it actually going to take me to write? I don't know, two hours to download a library, configure and style. Not very long at all, right? But I'm going to estimate it's going to be six to eight hours because we have to do the documentation in Jira, we do the documentation in Confluence, and all that stuff. So it really goes back into the estimate. Um, don't pad estimates just to pad estimates. But your estimate, I think, should always include all the extra stuff that needs to go in it, not just writing code. Uh, that was actually a criticism that I got very early in my career is you need to spend more time documenting. You're just jumping right into code, and that's not cool. So I think we all do that, right? As you, as you your agency grows and your documentation grows, how do you make sure that the folks in the trenches can get to the information they need to know how to do this stuff? I mean, there's got to be a way to sort it and search it. But if you've only got access to your project, how do we see that carousel document? Yeah. So that's, uh, I talked a little bit about Confluence earlier. That's important is to centralize your documentation somewhere that the entire agency or the entire team has access to. Uh, we try to document everything on Confluence. You can use any type of uh, documentation repository you want. That's just one that we use. And then I think it comes down to onboarding and training, which um, I know we have an issue with onboarding and training. We've been talking about that in our Drupal COE, where we learned about our pain points and we're iterating on those. Um, 
Yeah, so I think it's just a matter of getting getting the information to new employees, new hires. Hey, this is where our documents are. Go here and look. You said Drupal CRV? Yeah, Center of Excellence. I'm sorry, that's what we just, it's the group of Drupal developers that we have at VML YNR that meet once a month to talk about different Drupal things and figure out ways to fix our problems. Yep. So, at VML YNR, how do you all um, like avoid uh, like stale methods from propagating through your projects? Like how do you make sure that your documentation is always up to date? People aren't doing things that are now wrong. Yeah, documentation is hard to keep up to date, right? Uh, so earlier we talked a little about iterations, making sure that we're looking back at the things that we're doing good and things that we're good doing wrong, and then fixing it. So that's how we try to keep things from getting stale and propagating. As far as the documentation, uh, when we go in to do the architecture reviews or we go in to do the build docs, we look at them and we say, is that really how you're doing stuff still? Oh, no, nope, that's not right. Yeah, let's update that in conference. It's got to be very organic, unfortunately. There's no good way to go back and, well, not that I've found to go back and say, is our you know thousands of pages up to date? Uh, it's got to be very organic and make sure we document it. Uh, hopefully you hear these saying things like, is that in confluence? Because they should be saying that and then making sure that we're updating things. Is there any sort of uh, in confluence like uh, searching by publish date? Probably. <laughs> uh, I don't. I don't know. I'm not. It might that. be an interesting way to do like an audit of, of your yeah. documentation. If you say, "Give me everything that's more like more than a year old," and I'm going to flip through it. Yeah, that's that's a good idea. Um, it's a good thing to talk about in your Drupal COE. You can go to that, and you say, "Hey guys, how can we find a way to fix our documentation?" Uh, do you guys do, does anybody else do a, a Drupal COV type thing, a group that you just kind of get together and just talk about Drupal stuff? Not necessarily project related? Okay. That's a, that's a pretty cool idea. The other thing we do is lunch and learns. With our Drupal COV, you guys do lunch and learns? Okay, so that's part of our COV as well. Uh, somebody gives a, a presentation on a topic at least once a month. Any other questions before we continue there? Okay. Uh, so find the problems and fix the problems. This is a book that I assume everybody in software development has read by now because everybody's talked about it for at least the past five years. And if you have not read it, please go read it like tonight. It's a great book. Yeah, it's super narrative. It's, it's not a text manual. It's not something that's going to tell you how to write software. It is about a guy who learned where the inefficiencies in his organization were and learned to fix them. And I think uh, reading this book really turned around a lot of our practices. Whenever everybody started reading them, we started looking at things and going, wow, we could do better. Uh, we could find all the problems. So this book really talks about finding the problems and then fixing the problems. So earlier I talked about finding pain points. Somebody asked, uh, you know, how do we know when to push the envelope and when to leave things alone? It's about finding those, those pain points, looking to see what's hard, what, what makes us not want to come to work tomorrow, what are we dreading? Find those things and fix them because we don't want to dread work. Um, it's not just in finding the problems in our own organization or in Drupal either. It's learning how to work with the other or the other groups within your organization, right? Um, we're a creative agency, so we deal a lot with creative people uh, that are not technically and not digitally minded. So what's the best way to work with them? Uh, things like that. We, we want to go back, find those, find those problems and fix them. Uh, and then document them on Confluence. Document everything. Uh, even people that are technical, uh, analytics, we get these giant spreadsheets from analytics that say, tag all the things on the website. And we're just like, God, I hate doing this, going kind of through 100 rows in a spreadsheet and tagging things manually. How can we make this better? So we say, well, let's make this agnostic script. And, and anything that they say works this way, automatically gets tagged. It's finding the problems and fixing it. And then the last part here is getting hit by a bus. By the way, uh, when I'm going through and making these slides, I just like Google Images, uh, care personally, document, whatever. Google Images hit by a bus, not much comes up that you can actually put on the slide deck. <laughs> <laughs> this is about it. Uh, the caption has absolutely nothing to do with the talk. So has everybody heard about getting hit by a bus? So you should be able to get hit by a bus tomorrow and everything should be going swimmingly at work. 
nothing should change. And that is true throughout your entire organization, from the associate level junior developer to the CTO. Everybody should be able to get hit by a bus and nothing bad will happen. And the way we do that is by making sure that everybody can do your job and nobody is a linchpin. If anybody is holding up a project or is a linchpin and preventing things from getting done, that is an incredible inefficiency that needs to go out the window right now. Find somebody else that can also do that job or knows how to get something done. And that includes your time. Uh, Anne and Jennifer talked this morning about, um, about having personal time and things like that, right? Uh, don't get bothered on the weekends. Best way to do that is to spread the, spread the load around. Make sure everybody can do everything and you don't have that problem. If you are so overloaded that you know, you're working 60 hours a week and if you don't get this one thing done tomorrow, that project's not going to go out in time, that's a problem. Uh, spread the load around. Make sure everybody can do everything, including, you know, make decisions. So you should get hit by a bus. And that just goes down to teaching and accepting the fact that other people have the responsibility, not just you. And being okay with that. That's another thing that I just thought about. Uh, when running a Drupal organization, you got to be okay with the fact that things are not always going to be okay. Um, be okay with being uncomfortable. Comfortable being uncomfortable. A lot of things are going to happen on projects that you say, man, I can fix that. Yeah, but you got other things to do. So it's okay if something doesn't go quite right. Be okay with it. And that is all I have. Thank you for asking questions, by the way, and helping making this longer. <laughs> if anybody has any more questions, I'd be happy to talk about them. So I have a question. Yep. If, um, so you have, all your projects are marketing. So of course you have marketing plans, marketing projects, and technical plans, technical projects. Do you keep those separate? No. Um, well, kind of depends, I guess, is the actual answer. So a lot of what we do is working with some very big brands that do a lot of different things. Anything that has to do with marketing and digital, we generally combine and they're not separate. Uh, there's a lot of things where it's like, well, they're just doing signage or they're just doing billboards or movies or whatever. And yeah, we won't touch any of that stuff. Somebody at some level of planner or strategist is aware that both things are happening. So we're kind of like you know, driving uh, traffic to the websites from those things, but we're not really taking those into account. On the other side, though, anything that has to do with the website or with the Technology, not necessarily with the website, right? Some mobile apps, uh, banners, kiosks, things like that. All the marketing and technology kind of happens hand in hand. So, from the very onset of a project, there's a technology person that goes to literally every single meeting. A technology person is in the pitch, a technology person goes to the stand up, a technology person goes to the creative reviews, uh, which I think is actually a fairly new thing going to take not really creative reviews, because we got to be able to stand up and say, look, you're being a little unrealistic here. <coughs> Uh, or have you considered this, the fact that that's not ADA compliant, the fact that that's not going to help drive traffic to a website or something of that nature. So we really try to combine both of them from the earliest at all possible, and everybody works as a cross-functional team. Uh, that means that creative, UX, strategy, et cetera, are generally all in our stand-ups and in our sprint reviews and our retros, and they help write stories, and they help point stories and everything. Does that answer? Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. So how do you uh, go about charging clients for uh, work that you know you're going to reuse for the next client? That's a, that's a legal question. Because uh, you're so, talking about monetizing everything, yeah, document yeah. everything, have your, your library of... of uh, yeah. Um, so technically, I guess anything that we do, the client owns, right? But most of that's creative. They don't generally care that we're going to use the same carousel library on two different clients. Generally because everything we do is open source anyway, so they know they're getting free software. We actually talk about that a lot during the pitches and stuff as well as the fact that they're getting open source free software. They don't really care. As long as we don't use the same design, it's okay. Um, you might get into some legal issues. We'd actually talked about that before, about creating component libraries, and I'm like, well, maybe we shouldn't do that. But 
the very basic level stuff I think is okay. Anything else? I'm gonna say what I have to say and then shut up and stop talking. <laughs> Let the awkward sound hang. Okay, thank you guys. Uh, I'll share a build doc, I'll find one and make sure that I get that out to you guys. And then of course the architecture review one tomorrow, or we'll actually walk through an architecture review and talk a little bit about how those meetings go and what we look at as well. And that's my presentation. Thanks again. I'm hitting the button.